In our next session, we're gonna to learn that Israel learns a very tough lesson. The lesson is this, God leads them to their land of promise, but they're not ready. When they arrive at the land of promise, they, they use that B word we're gonna talk about in this session. They say, yeah, we see the promise of God, but we're afraid. See, here's, the, and then God does this amazing thing with them. Here's what he does. He leads them into the desert. We're gonna learn in this session that the desert is a classroom. It's a place where we learn and it's very intentional. It doesn't delay our healing. It doesn't delay our deliverance. It's part of it. And so you might recognize yourself as you watch these sessions, watch what God does, learn from them. See if you too have been in or maybe right now are in the classroom of the desert yourself and how very intentionally God is working because he wants to eradicate the slavery mindset and the slavery identity that's been a part of your life. Let's jump into session six. All right, welcome back. So we've, we've talked about moving out. We've talked about moving on. So we've been looking at movement, but now moving into a new season, the Israelites are going to enter a series that I've called Staying Put. Sometimes we feel like our deliverance, our story, the ways God is leading us, we actually feel like we get stuck in a place. Like, God, I thought you were moving me somewhere. Well, he is. You see, beyond the Red Sea miracle is this time of wandering in the desert for the Israelites. They have to wander in the desert for a very particular reason. We're going to talk about that. But the desert experience can, be, can feel very hopeless and helpless. It can feel purposeless. It can feel like, God, why am I here? Why am I wandering? I thought you called me into action. I mean, we're all, you know, this is being filmed in America. We're all good Americans. We're all about productivity. I feel like my job review is gonna really be bad with you when you do my performance review because I'm not producing anything. What are you doing in me? I feel like our progress is stalled. I thought I was on the way to the promised land. What in the world are you bringing me into this desert for? And that's what God has brought the Israelites to. The reason they are there is that they actually move forward and have an opportunity to enter the promised land the first time, but it doesn't go well. We're going to talk about that later in one of our other sessions. And because it doesn't go well, it simply is a reflection that they're not ready. It, there still are these shreds of the slavery identity and the slavery mindset in them. They're not prepared. So how do they get prepared? Well, they might have it in their mind to do it one way. Well, God, just tell us. Well, hasn't he told them? You know, he has told them, but they've not necessarily got it yet. They require a very special classroom, the classroom of the desert. There is no other circumstance like wandering to get to the heart of the lingering internal foes. Wanderings get us alone with God so he can do a work of deliverance that can't be done any other way. You know, those of you that have little kids, have you ever had your little kid is just like distracted by everything? And it's like you're trying to direct them and you tell them what to do and it's like they're just ignoring you and they're still acting out and doing all this stuff and finally you like have to pick them up, sit them down and go, look at me. No, no, no. Look at me straight in the eyes. I'm telling you, blah, 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 blah. And this is what God does in the desert. It's like, okay, I am going to get your full and undivided attention on purpose so we can do a very purposeful work. But God, we're not moving anywhere. I know, sit still. There's purpose in this. But God, aren't we supposed, we tried the promised land once, remember? And you were like, they're big, they're enemies there. And now we've got to go back. Look at me, listen to me, follow exactly what I say, do what I do, do it repetitively, and you will learn a great deal from it. It's all still part of his plan to make you a warrior. We think we got to be doing something for God. And God says, why don't you change your mind and see what I'm doing in you first so that you can do that thing for me later with the power and the equipment that you need. When we feel stalled, sometimes it's not stalled at all. Look at this scripture passage right on page 25 in your workbook. Welcome to the desert. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. There we are grumbling again. 
The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You know, you can almost hear the drama in their voice, right? If only we had died in Egypt. You know, you can almost hear it, right? We, we do that too. We get all full of drama now and then. But the reality is God is doing something in their hearts. Notice where their heart attachment is. Their hearts are still not attached to God. Their identity has not been remade in who they are as a child of God. Their mindset is still not on God. They are still exhibiting yearning for a lingering devotion to Egypt. Why are you in the desert? Why is it hot, barren, isolated, and full of sand? It's there because you still love the devil you know, even though you wrote a divorce decree. You still love in some way the devil you know, even though I've moved you forward and shut the Red Sea behind you, even though I've moved you forward and closed this door behind you, you are still exhibiting signs that your heart is divided, your love is divided, your mind is divided, and we know that divided hearts, divided minds, divided lives, divided thinking is divided and it will never be fully submitted to God. And God is like, I'm bringing you out here into a blank canvas. Look at me. Listen to me. But we can't go here. I know you're staying put for a while until we learn this. And this is his love and grace. This isn't his harm because the stuff that's still in us, that's still harming us in our thinking and our identity, he wants to get it out of us. The desert is God's classroom. The question is, will we learn what God is teaching us in his classroom? You ever had a student in a classroom that just didn't want to learn? I'm here. You can keep talking. It's like you got Charlie Brown's teacher, right? You're not learning anything. You're there, you're present, but you're not learning. How long do you need to stay in the classroom? Until you learn. Until even your mind is changed into one of learning and, address, and learning that what God is doing in you and through you and for you is so beneficial. So the desert is hot and it is barren, and it's isolated, and it's sand. We're gonna take a look that all of these things are on purpose. Here's the thing about the heat of the desert. You ever, told, you ever talked about your life and said, man, I feel like you know, the heat's getting turned up on me. You know, God is turning up the heat. Why the desert? Oh my goodness. Well, heat draws out of our body all the moisture that's in it, which causes us to do what? Thirst. And when we thirst, we need that to be satisfied by being given water. Water, in terms of the spiritual in the Bible, always refers to the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. The water of the Holy Spirit, like a fountain, right? We know that those who are filled with the Spirit, it wells up into this fountain. And so if we are parched, it is to teach us where are we getting water from. Our old thinking always knows to go to the oppressive sources for our supply. God is like in the desert, you have nowhere to go. You only have one person to ask, and that's me. And God will give them water. He makes Moses, his servant, strike a rock with his staff. Again, all of this tension and anxiety in one act, whack, hits a rock with his staff, and water comes gushing out. Isn't this amazing too, like, like the connection between the New Testament and the old? Water gushing forth from the rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation and the rock was stricken and the Holy Spirit was poured out as a result of the being stricken. We are the beneficiaries of that now. You can't make this stuff up. God wants us to look to him for the supply. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water. You'd never thirst again. See, she had it all confused. She was looking at the natural. The Israelites are still looking at the natural. The location, the tangible water, the pots of meat, it's all the natural. They're still in love with the natural. They're still thinking like slaves. God needs to get them thinking. And in the heat, he cranks up the heat so that he cranks up their thirst so that they will look to him and say, we're dying of thirst here. Father, you give us something instead of saying, Father, send us back to the oppressor. 
So many times we still want to return back to our old ways and drink from that polluted stream. we got to stop drinking from polluted streams and exchange them for living water. In our thirst, will we learn to trust God when our old supply of oppressive water is gone? The second is this, the desert is barren, and it's barren on purpose. Over on page 26 of our workbook, the desert is barren on purpose. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? In the desert, nothing grows. In the desert, you can't plant stuff in the sand and expect plants to rise up. It doesn't happen. There's no water, no plants means there's no food, right? And so if there's no food and there's no water, you're hungry now too. You get in this thirst and hunger, thirst and hunger. And notice before this experience even starts, what are they hungry for? What are they thirsty for? Send us back. Let us go back. Reopen that door. Let me go backwards into the old ways. Let me go back to my old thinking. And God is saying, no, we have to move forward. So God is ready to provide for them food. And what is the food? It's manna. This is the most beautiful lesson, I think, here. You know, he's, he tells them, you're not going to know what this stuff is. Which, by the way, in the Hebrew, did you know what the word manna means? It means what is it? Man is actually a question. What is it? So they're like, you're going to give us food, God. What is it? He says, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like the who's on first thing, right? You know, we don't know what this is. I know. Will it nourish me? Yes. Is it enough? Yes. Can I get a week's supply in advance so I know where my food's coming from? No. In fact, if you keep it an extra day, there'll be maggots in it. Yeah, like God is serious, like he'd give us maggots. I'm going to save some for tomorrow. And you go back and open the canister and go, holy cow, there's maggots on my manna. And we have to throw it out, right? This is where when we hear Jesus say, and this is how you pray, give us this day our daily bread, is that every day we are looking to his hand. Every day we are seeking him for supply. Every day. But we're Americans. We walk up to our cupboards, we open them up, the pantry's absolutely full of a thousand things, and we say, there's nothing to eat, let's go out. And we shut the cupboards and we go out. And we want to live that way, and so did the Israelites. We set around pots of meat. And God's like, yeah, take your eyes off that. I'm going to show you something better. But it's going to be food you don't know what it is. So that the, the whole idea of the entire production of food, the planting, the harvesting, the producing it, the cooking it, all this stuff, I'm taking all that right off the table so we can learn one very important lesson. You're going to look to me for your provision. Because what you have forgotten and what you don't even know is those pots of meat you even had in Egypt, they came from my hand and now I'm going to prove it to you. Even when you were fed in oppression, it was coming from my hand. And now you're going to learn, that it, but it's going to happen in a blank canvas. You feel like, God, I'm all alone. I don't even know where my next dime's coming from. Great, I'm going to teach you to trust me in that moment. And I'm going to prove my glory to you. So the desert is hot on purpose. It's barren on purpose. And there are places for you to write in here in all of these steps. I actually have you rewrite them and speak them out loud. Why would I have you do this in the groups? Because this is how we teach ourselves. We need to reprogram. We need to get our brains transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's the way we do it. We write right here at the bottom of page 26 in your workbook. I ask you to rewrite this phrase and speak it out loud. God is my provider no matter what my surroundings are. 
So if you're in the desert, in a hot place, in a barren place, it doesn't matter. God, you are my provider, even when I feel like nothing is being provided. God, you are my provider. We go over to the next page. Manna teaches us that grumbling didn't move the hand of God. Do you ever think your grumbling is going to move the hand of God? You know, like if like the squeaky wheel gets the grease, therefore before God I will be the squeaky wheel. Well, the squeaky wheel may work with a utility company's customer service rep, but it doesn't work with God. You can squeak all you want, and you can even creak and groan. And sometimes that isn't what's going to get his attention. Because if the groaning comes out of a spirit that's still loving the old ways, God's going to erase that so he can move you into new ways. You hearing what I'm saying? He wants to move you forward so the grumbling isn't going to do it. So I have you write this and speak it out loud. God does not provide for me because I grumble, but because he loves me and cares for me. The next one is manna is unknown. God, however, is known. We don't need to know what we're eating. We only need to know who's feeding us. So I ask you to rewrite this phrase and speak it out loud. I do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, O Lord. You need to learn that. I needed to learn that. We all need to learn that. We hear that scripture and we love that scripture. And we still walk out of church all the time, not trusting God anymore. And we did when we walked in. Man does not live by bread alone. We put it on calendars. We hang it up on artwork in our hallway. We hear about it in church, but we don't live the principle. My sustenance is in his hands. My very life. God taught me through all of these lessons in my life. I've learned to pray this prayer. It's like, Lord, I am dust. And as long as this dust has your breath of life in it, I'm just giving it back to you. That's all. It, it's not, and that is not a shaming or humiliating posture. That's a beautiful, powerful, humble posture. I'm dust. But as long as this dust has your breath of life, notice who it's acknowledging. And then worship. I'll sacrifice it back to you. See, this is where God is wanting to get them. It's where he had to get me. I grumbled at him a lot. It wasn't my grumbling that motivated him. Sometimes he's like, you, you know, have you ever done that? We go back to the kid, right, that God is saying we're going to get your attention and sit you still. Have you ever done that? The kid just continues to nag you and nag you and nag you in the store for something. And finally you look at the kid and go, you know what? You are wasting your tears, kid. You can cry all you want. You can yell all you want. I am not buying that for you. So are you done already so we can get on with getting on? And sometimes, I, you know, God's a good father, He's an excellent parent, He's an, and he is not dysfunctional. He will move us forward in the ways that teach us what is best for us. He doesn't respond to our grumbling. Next, beyond the, the heat and the barrenness, is that the desert is isolated on purpose. I love this verse from Exodus 40. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel during their travels. See, this became a lesson on obedience. Here's how we're going to do this, people. You're going to set up camp. You're going to put the tabernacle in there. And I am going to display my presence in it with a pillar of cloud by day and put fire in the pillar at night so that you'll know that I'm there. When you see it, you stay put. When it goes away, you get up and you move. And I will tell you where we're going and when to stop. And then you set up camp and the pillar will be there. And as long as the pillar is there, you stay. And when it goes away, we get up and we move. Do we understand what we're doing here? You see, it's a very isolated time where God is saying, learn this rhythm of obedience. This is going to be very simple. It's not this big miraculous sign. He is teaching them a very simple thing. Repeat after me. Follow after me. I want you to, I'm teaching you to recognize my presence, and I'm teaching you how and when, how to move. It's not because of what's in your heart. It's because of what's in my heart. I am not teaching you to wander across the land because you think you should go somewhere. I am teaching you to live in and follow my presence and to learn to live in presence with me. I want you present with me in your thoughts and I want you to know that I want you to be present with you and I want you to learn rhythms of obedience. It's a very simple yet profound rule. You go, why would God do that? Do I really need that? Do I need that? Yes, you do. I did. 
We all do. We all need simple rhythms of obedience. We're getting the attention of the kid. <laughs> look at me. No, no, look at me. Don't, no, no, don't look, look at me. Okay, here's what we're doing. This is what God does with us sometimes. Here's what we're doing. Sometimes in our lives, we need a very regimented, controlled environment by God, a very disciplined environment. There are many different ways in our lives that we go through seasons of this. Why is it when soldiers check into boot camp, they do all kinds of things. They, base, they take their clothing, they like take their identity, and they're like, here is the rhythm. You have just signed your life over to us. Here is the schedule. You will follow this. What are they, who are they training up? Soldiers. What are they doing in that moment? They are eradicating whatever mindset and identity they came in with, and they are constructing a whole new mindset and identity. Are they in war yet? No. Are they back at home? No. Is the family allowed to just come visit loosey-goosey anytime they want? No. They are training them the weight of a weapon in their hand. They are training them discipline. They are training them in new skills. They are training them what's going to happen when they do end up in war. It all happens right there it's intentional it's on purpose the drill sergeants will get in their face and scream and yell is it just that it's a mean old drill sergeant no he's been in the battlefield he knows what it's like and he wants those guys to fall into place you're being taught and it's being done in a camp a controlled environment and God will get us into a controlled environment so he can get our attention, so he can get us in intention, so he can get us to learn to live in his presence, so he has our full and undivided attention. He will feed us things that we do not know what they are. He will give us water that we've never experienced. He teaches us that we must look to him for everything. If we've looked to bad relationships, he wants us to look to his relationship. You know, for people that are constantly like, I am incomplete until I, I'm in a relationship. Well, you know, this is just true. There's, there's single people who would love to be married, and there's married people who would love to be single. That's just true, right? Don't raise your hand if you're one of them, right? Especially if you're sitting next to your spouse. But the reality is, is that relationships are hard. And yet when we fall in love, we think everything's awesome. And then we, we wake up one day and they're like, what did I do? <laughs> or your spouse is waking up next to you and looking at you and saying, what did I do? You see, there, there's these, these things that we have to get out of our mind. And God is saying all the time, let me be the lover of your soul. Let me be the hand that provides for you. You do not earn that living for yourself. I want you to give back to me because that teaches you obedience. I want you to understand where the supply comes from. And he does it in the desert. So the desert's hot. It's barren. It's isolated. And the last thing is the desert is sand. And it's sand on purpose. You know, sand is very difficult to walk in. You know, when you get in sand, have you ever tried to run in deep sand before? you run with twice as much effort and three times as many steps to get a tenth of the distance. You really do. I mean, if you want to get really sore muscles, run in sand for a while. You know, that's why I don't do that. But that's what we can do. I just don't run in sand because, well, I don't run in sand. He puts them, however, in sand. Now think about this for a moment. Someone who's in training for running in sports, they sometimes will actually attach extra weight to their person. To do what? Build their endurance, build their strength. But it also slows them down so that when the weight goes away, it speeds them up. Are we getting the image here for the Israelites? He's slowing them down in the sand so that when the weight of it goes away, they will speed up. He's training them in their endurance. All the way through the Bible, it talks about the way we live our lives day to day as a what? A walk, step by step. We walk with the Lord, walk in my ways, walk in obedience to my commands. Sand makes us slow down. It makes us be more intentional in our walk. 
Our steps require, when we're in the sand, our steps require more effort. And this is where we're constantly feeling like, God, what are you doing? It's hot, you're making me intentionally thirsty. It's barren, you're making me intentionally hungry. It's isolated, I'm intentionally alone. And now it's sand and I'm intentionally tired. What are you up to? And God would say to you, I'm training you. I'm training you to look to me the fountain of living water. I'm training you to look to me, the manna, the bread that comes down from heaven. I'm training you to look to me because you feel like you're isolated, but you are never alone and never have a reason to be afraid. I am training you. Your steps are slow now, but when I lead you out, you will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. That's what I'm doing. Can you see that? And they couldn't see it. All they could do is grumble. And once in a while, we can't see it. And we might grumble. Deuteronomy 8.3 is how God talks about how he fed them in the desert. He says, he humbled you. Here's, here, that's the last punchline. What is this doing? God's not in the business of humiliating you, but he will humble you. God never humiliated me, but oh, he's humbled me. Causing you to hunger some people say, would God do that? Would a good God cause me to hunger if you needed it? Absolutely. And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You need to say this to yourself. This is at the bottom of the last page of these notes on page 28. In the classroom of the desert, I am being molded, shaped, trained, formed, transformed, and taught to eradicate the old self and strengthen the new self. I am being prepared to be a warrior, the kind of warrior needed to overcome my Jericho. This is what God's doing in you. The whole purpose of this session and, and the sessions coming through here is to enlighten us to the true understanding of what God is doing. Because we look at the earthly, we stay in the circumstances. It's hot, it's barren, it's isolated, it's sand. I have no idea what you're doing, God. Now you know. Now you know what he's up to. When your steps are slow and they're hard, you'll know that he's training you. When, the, when it seems like he's brought you out there all alone, just you and him face to face, he's training you. When you're having to look to his hand when everything else has gone away and all your supply chain has withered up in front of you and you have no idea what you're doing, now we can see in the scripture when God would bring famine what he's doing. He's saying you have to look to me. I am the one who makes the stuff grow out of the ground, not you. If the supply chain is dried up, I'm going to get your eyes to turn heavenward and off of your, your comfort down here and in the discomfort I'm drawing you up to me he is raising you up and every part of this they weren't ready for this step they weren't ready for the desert as soon as they came out of Egypt but they're ready now they weren't ready for the promised land yet the desert is this space that says you're not ready for the promised land and I out of my love am never sending you back into the oppression of slavery no matter how much you tell me you're yearning for it you are now in my hands you are the clay, I am the potter, let's get busy. How does God do that? It's actually not in a season of movement, it's in a season of staying put. That's why we called this session that way. If you're in the staying put season, embrace it. See it for what it is. And open your heart to God and say, I am willing to learn every lesson you have for me. And I will stay put on the timeline of your choosing because I trust the details of my life to you to know that you will allow me to move out of the staying put place when I am ready and I won't determine when I'm ready. I'll let you determine that. Amen? Amen. This has been a really powerful teaching revealing to us that the desert's a very intentional classroom of God that it's hot on purpose, it's barren on purpose, he gets us isolated on purpose, and it's full of sand on purpose. They're all very powerful lessons that will teach us. Now in the workbook, there's places where we can write and we, there's invitations to speak, to actually give voice to the truths that are in the workbook. Be sure that you're engaging in this process. This is very important. Write down the things that you're learning and speak out those truths. 
Because the desert's a classroom, open yourself up before God and say, God, I'm ready to receive everything you have for me. Make sure you get every lesson because they are all valuable. Every one of them will teach you and they're going to continue to build you into this new person God is creating as he just gets rid of that old slavery identity and mindset. I hope you're seeing that, that lesson by lesson, session after session, that's getting further and further in your past and you are becoming something new. So do that work, hang in there with us, and then let's move on to our next session.